sounds great. And before we begin to the panelists, I just want to say thank you for joining us today. Really grateful that you're taking time out of your busy lives uh, to, to share and um, your insights, wisdom, and work with, with other community members. Okay, so we're right at 3.30. Welcome everyone to the Sustainable Cleveland 2020 Virtual Summit. This is the last of our concurrent breakout sessions. We would like to thank our host for the summit, the Cleveland Public Library. My name is Kathy Len. I'm the Sustainable Cleveland Manager for the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. And we have joined the Community Organizing and Engagement Breakout Session, How You Can Get Involved. Our moderator for this session is Ty Olson with Tri-C's Conflict Resolution and Peace Studies Program. Thank you, Ty. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. My computer froze for a second. Um, yay, technology. So I just want to say uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us today. Um, Kathy, thank you for helping us put this session together and all your work um, for this year's summit. Uh, for those of you that are joining us, we're, we're going to be talking about community organizing and engagement and how to get involved. And there's not a better way, in my opinion, than having people that are organizing in our community and very engaged in our community share the work that they're doing and share um, some wisdom and insights and resources uh, for for others. Um, so today's session is is uh, each of our participants has been prepped with a few um, questions they'll be sharing. It's a panel conversation, and what that's going to look like is we're going to give each of the panelists around five minutes to share a little bit about themselves, the organization that they work, work for or with, um, and a little bit about their involvement in the community. Um, and then after everyone is done sharing, We'll take some time for question and answers, and I'll be facilitating. Again, my name is Ty Olson. I work at Tri-C primarily um, as the manager and adjunct faculty in our conflict resolution and peace studies program, and also do some consulting and, and community organizing around uh, conflict and peace and justice studies issues. So um, with what I'm going to do is just quickly introduce our panelists, and uh, Christopher will be our first to speak. But w while I share um, the names and, and roles of each of the panelists, would you, as panelists, just kind of wave? Um, can you hear me OK? OK, cool. So just kind of wave when I, when I say, your, say your name. So um, Christopher. Uh, Alvarado is the executive director of Slavic Village Development. Um, Chris, it's great to have you on board today. Uh, Erica Brown is the executive, is a um, community network builder at Neighborhood Connections. Uh, Rachel, um, uh, Rachel, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name. I'm sorry about that. Uh, is the executive vice president of Cleveland Leadership Center. Um, and Jeremy Taylor is the director of community involvement at Detroit Shoreway, uh, CDO. And JP Grotley is the community manager of the community um, or program manager of Community Innovation Network at CWRU, Case Western Reserve University. Um, so welcome, uh, and thank you for joining us. So to get us started off, I'm going to give Christopher um, some space to share for, for around five minutes. Um, I know Christopher could talk for probably five hours about all the amazing work that you guys are doing. Uh, so Christopher, if, if it's going a little long, I'll jump in, but uh, take it away, my friend. So much. Uh, so uh, again, Chris Alvarado. 
executive director here at Slavic Village Development. We serve the Broadway Slavic Village neighborhood on the near southeast side of Cleveland. Uh, so basically, if you leave downtown Cleveland along uh, Broadway and you go all the way down to Garfield Heights, it's all the neighborhoods surrounding uh, that street. Um, my role here, uh, the title is executive director, but that basically means I do whatever my staff, my council members, and all the folks who live and work in this neighborhood uh, tell me to do. Uh, so hopefully I will uh, take uh, directions from Ty as well as I uh, to take directions uh, from uh, our neighborhood. Um, you know, the, the question here is about community organizing and engagement. And really in order to do that well, uh, it's important to be able to be a part of a community that is receptive to the gifts that each one of you have uh, as, as community residents, as community stakeholders. And that can be really challenging. Uh, one, because organizations, whether they're small organizations or large institutions, may have difficulty being responsive to, uh, to folks. Uh, a lot of people are used to only hearing from uh, neighborhood residents when something has gone wrong. And, and honestly, that's a big reason why folks become organizers, whether professional organizers or uh, citizen organizers. Um, that's a big reason why they become that in the first place, it, it, to redress real issues that we have in our neighborhood. And it, it can be difficult for uh, institutions to, to hear uh, what they perceive as negative things. Really what the role of community development corporations like ours uh, like Detroit Shoreway Community Deve Development Organization that Jeremy serves, it really should be to lean into those issues. Another reason why a lot of folks kind of have difficulty uh, engaging with their neighborhood is that there's already, there may already be other folks filling those roles, uh, block club leaders or organizational leaders or uh, folks who are very active on neighborhood Facebook pages, for example. And so it can be very difficult uh, to feel like your voice is going to be heard. One of the things that I'm very proud of, uh, what we're doing here in, in uh, Broadway Slavic Village, and, and really at the beginning of this, is to open up the opportunities for neighborhood residents to become organizers. Um, one of the reasons we did this is because uh, it's been several years since we've done a neighborhood-wide master plan. And those of you who are planners know the master plans are usually conducted by uh, folks who already have power in the neighborhood. They may be property owners, they may be uh, business owners, uh, they may be block club leaders who oftentimes act as gatekeepers, oftentimes unknowingly, that keep other voices from, from entering in. And what we wanted to do was make sure that all voices were being heard. So a couple of years ago, we started our community uh, steward program where we've been able to work with great folks like Erica Brown uh, with Neighborhood Connections, uh, with uh, uh, organizations like Third Space, uh, led by uh, uh, Evelyn Burnett, uh, to provide a training to 21 folks who live here in the neighborhood who may not have already been leaders in our, uh, in our uh, Broadway neighborhood uh, 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 area. Um, and to give them training in uh, uh, the, the Neighbor Up program, in racial equity, in dealing with trauma, because so many of our residents, not just in, in our neighborhood, but across the city and, and across the nation, have experienced some kind of trauma. We've all been living a shared trauma over the last uh, six months. And so being able to know how to, to work with folks who've experienced that trauma is really important. So we started this, this model in order to not just provide training, but we also provided the stipend to these folks so that they can start programs, so that they can um, connect with their neighbors and identify ways to build community in their own way outside of the normal community organizing space. And so I, I think if I would leave one thing for y'all, it is to look for organizations like neighbor connections, like a Detroit Shoreway, like a Slavic Village Development, that may be able to provide you opportunities to uh, make the kind of changes that you want to see in, in your neighborhood. One last thing is one of the reasons why we started this was based off of our work with uh, Burton Belcar, Detroit Shoreway, uh, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, um, Famicos Foundation, and others uh, around uh, climate uh, action, uh, the uh, Climate Resiliency Urban Initiative here in Cleveland.
Uh oh, I think we we are experiencing a technical difficulty. Um, and I, I'm not sure, uh, Chris hopefully will be able to jump back on with us and finish his thoughts. I know he was near the end. Um, so I am going to um, see, Erica, are you able to join us? And if not, we might jump right to Rachel. Can you hear us, Erica? Are you good? Rachel, I think we're gonna, Erica's fi figuring out her audio. Um, we're gonna go to you second, okay, Rachel? Does that work? Okay, I know there, hopefully this will work. Um, and I see Chris coming back, so I don't know if we wanna wait a moment and see. Yeah, if you don't mind. She's, I think, with the video and audio kind of just dropping out. Yeah, so. it, just, it just dropped out. And, uh, yeah, uh, All right, I should I go ahead and Let's give Chris a, a final 30 seconds to finish his thought, and then we'll then I'll pass it over to Rachel. 15 seconds. So uh, basically, your value. Uh, organizations like ours may not know that they're valued yet. Um, connect with us. Uh, connect with you know, one of the great things about the city of Cleveland is that you've got community development corporations all across. Connect up with somebody there to identify and say, hey, I've got this idea. Chances are that CDC may have funds or have resources already available for you to be able to do what you want to do. Please connect to us. That's it. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. We'll we'll come back to you in a little bit when we open questions. Uh, we're gonna pass it off to Rachel. Um, Rachel works at the Cleveland Leadership Center. Rachel, welcome. Hi, and I am excited to be here today. I'm Rachel Chumcha, Executive Vice President with the the organization. I am a graduate of our Cleveland Bridge Builders program. What launched me into this um, kind of new career trajectory? I had been in the social work and healthcare, the CBD program. I joined CLC to really focus on my passion of that macro level leadership development, and community engagement. The mission of CLC is to provide or build a continuum of civic leaders committed to our community as a catalyst for civic engagement. We provide leadership and community engagement opportunities across a wide spectrum of life and career stages to inspire, connect, and challenge individuals to make a positive community impact. We offer programs across a range of ages and stages. So we work with high school students and college students through Campus Cleveland, young professionals in Onboard Cleveland, mid-career professionals in Cleveland Bridge Builders, senior level executives in Leadership Cleveland, retirees in our Legacy Leaders Program. And we have two programs that look at kind of all ages, kind of more of an intergenerational cohort. The first being Civic Leadership Institute, which really provides kind of civic education on our landscape in Cleveland and the Advanced Leadership Institute, which focuses more on the policy landscape of the community. Our goal is to really collaborative leadership skills, awareness of community issues, and identifying how to be better involved through collaborations with others in the community to really make a difference in Cleveland. Once you graduate, you are an alum of CLC, and we provide ongoing education, connections, and engagement opportunities for really kind of that lifelong civic engagement. Our programs do range from application and selection based through open enrollment, and they do come with a cost, but we do provide scholarship assistance in hopes that the cost is not a barrier for participation. We do also offer some community opportunities. So one is Accelerate, which is our annual civic pitch competition. This is for individuals with big ideas on how to impact the community. Ultimately, the prize is seed money to help them launch their ideas. And we also offer SPARK, which is an annual half-day leadership conference on innovation in leadership. So as we look at the past few months with how we've been able to still provide our programs and connect individuals with the community despite all that's going on, um, we quickly transition to our programs being hosted virtually. And we are looking at ways on how we can safely bring people together. 
We also looked at creating a space for learning and connections across the community. And we created a new weekly lunchtime series, our Way Forward Leader Lunch Break. So these are free weekly sessions with leaders and facilitators from around the community who can speak to what's happening in their world and how they are leading through today's challenges. These are free and open to the community, and we are going to continue these as we look ahead. So visit our website uh, to see the schedule and to register for one of the upcoming opportunities. We also will be hosting our Accelerate program this coming year. Uh, most likely will be a virtual experience on February 25th. We are going to be seeking applications for those individuals who want to apply to pitch at Accelerate, and those will be available beginning November 1st on our website. And we also have our Spark Conference, which we hosted virtually back in September. We have um, access to the recordings and the online platform to be able to learn from those, even if you weren't able to attend and still connect with the community. And we have alumni across all ages, stages, um, thousands of alums who have gone through our programs over the years. And we've watched them go out into the community, serve on boards, mentor other leaders, um, start new initiatives, advocate for issues, and we will continue to support them in those efforts. And I'm happy to answer any questions later and hope you will consider learning more and being involved with. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing. I, I have done some work with the Cleveland Leadership Center and just an amazing resource in the community here in Northeast Ohio. Um, we'll, we'll have some opportunity here in a little bit to answer any more questions about your work. Um, so Erica, are you good now? Can you hear me? Are you good? Um, we'll, get, we'll go to Erica and then JP, you'll follow up Erica, okay? Erica, you are on. Awesome. Thank you. It, it's 2020. It happens. <laughs> so hi, I'm Erica Brown. I'm the Community Network Manager for Training and Special Projects at Neighborhood Connections. I support the network, which is a network of over 3,500 people who really care about co-creating amazing communities right where they are. Um, at our core and in the very beginning, primarily a grassroots grant making organization. And the way that we do that is through small grants that go up to $5,000 that go directly to residents in order to help groups of three or more residents in the same community in Cleveland or East Cleveland affect change right where they are. Um, what I do on the training side and in support of the Neighborhood Network is really support people as they recognize their individual power, uh, recognize how they can combine that with other residents around them and build their collective power and then go do the thing that they want to do to make community better right where they are. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now, since we had to transition, everything was an in-person gathering for us. Many of you have probably been in our circles before for a neighbor up gathering, a neighbor night, a network night, community of practice, any of the events that we've done. Um, we've switched to a virtual platform. So now weekly we are doing something that's called community of practice where people get an opportunity to still come together, have important conversations about the things that matter to them, um, figure out who else is interested in the same things, and, and then take that to the next level, take that conversation and act on it later. And they can still get support. Um, we're not doing our traditional grant cycle right now, but we do have money available for communities who are dealing with COVID response. Um, and also right now, specifically through um, work with Common Ground through the Cleveland Foundation, we have money available for uh, count me in dollars. And that's for people who are working to get out the vote this November 3rd. Thank you. Awesome, Erica. So 2020, my uh, going to update in the middle of our session. So um, we are going to hand it over to JP, and then JP will be followed by Jeremy. So JP, take it away, my friend. All right, thanks, Ty. Um, uh, well, uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is JP Gralti, um, and I'm the program manager for the Community Innovation Network, which is located in the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Community Innovation Network, we are cultivating a new culture of collaborative community change. Uh, we're bridge builders, so we build bridges in the form of relationships between residents and institutions. 
We build bridges of trust between communities and organizations, and we build bridges of dialogue between community building research and practices. Um, some of my own you know, personal uh, passions are, are doing this community building work across lines of difference. Um, in my own personal spare time, I love being outside, I love cooking, I love baking. Um, so those are things about me. Um, some programs and activities offered by us, I'm gonna try to keep these focused on um, things that are probably most relevant for, for all of you folks who are looking in this, you know, you've, you've attended this summit, you're excited about how do I make change in my community? How do I take action next? Um, so I wanna share a few different things. Um, first of all, one of the things we do is we take this approach um, that's, uh, uh, that, that academics would call ABCD, or asset-based community development. And this is a shift in, in approach from, for community development. Instead of focusing on the deficits or what's not there, we focus on gifts and assets uh, that are in the community. So it's like if you take a glass of water and, and you know, focusing on the deficits, what we would do is look at you know, what's the part that's empty, uh, focusing on the assets helps us look at what's the part that's full? What are we building on? What do we have already present in our community? So there's two kind of core questions we ask in asset-based community development. Number one is what are the gifts, skills, or abilities that you have that you're willing to share with others? So examples of this could be like what I shared. I really love to cook. It could be childcare. It could be reading. It could be I'm great at singing, gardening, listening, praying, teaching, sewing, home repair, uh, construction, it, et cetera, right? Those are all gifts. Those are all things that we, we have and, and, and that we could be willing to share with others, right? And then the second piece is asking, what do you care about? So examples maybe related to the summit could be climate change, affordable housing, renewable energy, clean water, clean air, um, right, et, et cetera. We, we care about a lot of different things. But So think about what, what do you care about? What, did, what brought you here? to this summit. And in asset-based community development, and so this is my challenge for all of you who are here wondering, okay, how do I, how do I actually go and make change? What do I do next? Uh, is, is that we need to use deep listening in order to identify what is the motivation to act versus what is just opinion. And so if you think about what you've learned today, you probably have a lot of opinions, right? And opinions are, in, in, in this case, in kind of community development, community organizing, what do I want someone else to go do? So I could want, you know, the United States to, to you know, become a, a global leader in, in fighting for climate change, right? I'm not gonna do anything about that, uh, you know, personally, right? Um, and then it's, you contrast, you know, that with what do I have motivation? What's my motivation to act? And so, or the people around you, what's their motivation to act? And that's the, what, the difference between that and opinion, right? Opinion is just, what do I want someone else to do? My motivation to act is, what do I wanna do myself? And that motivation to act is fueled by three forces. Our concerns, so what do we want to not happen? Our dreams and our goals, what do we wanna create? What's the community we wanna create? What's the world we wanna create? And the third thing is opportunity to contribute your gifts in a particular way. So when you have all of those three things or, or some of those three things, right, that really fuels our motivation to act. And so in Community Innovation Network, what we do is we start with people's gifts and we build from there. So I want you to all come away from this and, and, and really think about that and think about, you know, not just, okay, what did I learn? What are my opinions? What, what change do I want to see? But what change do I want to create? What do I want to be a part of? What am I willing to go out and do. And let me look at the people around me, the people who are in my network who maybe didn't attend this summit. What do they care enough about to act? What are their gifts and skills? Ask them, have those conversations, do some deep listening and build from there. Um, to help you do this, um, the Community Innovation Network, we have a number of, of, of things that we do. So we have a, a program that we call the Innovators Monthly Meetup, where we gather folks doing this work. We call it folks who are on the front lines of community change. Um, so this happens on the second Friday of every month. Right now they're on Zoom. Uh, before the COVID times, they used to be in person uh, with, with lunch and, and, and it was a, a great energized gathering. Now they're on Zoom with also, we try to keep the energy up and, and it, it allows you know, folks to come in and bring their own community building challenges and tap into the wisdom of the network um, when you're there. 
We also offer uh, trainings in strength-based approaches to collaborative community change, like asset-based community development that I just walked through. Um, and we also do some consulting around that. Um, and I will actually uh, put our website into uh, the, the chat um, for any of you to peruse there later. You can also um, sign up for those Innovators Monthly Meetups um, on the website there. So I'll pop that in the chat next. Um, so that's that's my part. I don't know who we're at, Ty, and I'll turn it back to you. Or if, if Ty's tech is not working, I know Jeremy, he said you were up next. So maybe I'll just turn it straight over to Jeremy. I'm back. Yes, thank you, JP. I missed the very end there. Um, Jeremy, take it away, my friend. Can you hear? So before I thank everyone there again, um, thanks, thanks, Ty and JP. Um, uh, thank you all for, uh, uh, you know, caring up about these different topics about, you know, community organizing, community engagement to take some time and uh, join us on this new, this is a new uh, app for me and I had some technical difficulties like everybody, but this is great. It's really cool. Um, again, my name is Jeremy Taylor. I'm the Director of Community Involvement at Detroit Shoreway Community Development Organization, as well as Cadell Improvement Incorporated. Um, but uh, for today's conversation, we we'll focus uh, mostly on um, Detroit Shoreway, which is a neighborhood on the west side and the uh, right kind of our central hub is the Gordon Square Arts District um, at West 65th and Detroit Shoreway or West 65th and Detroit Avenue. Um, and we guide the uh, physical, social, economic, and cultural um, development of the Detroit Shoreway neighborhood and the uh, communities within it. Um, we're a very diverse uh, neighborhood, um, one of the most diverse in the city of Cleveland. We've got um, white people, black people, Hispanic, uh, and, and Asian, and also um, literally refugees from all over the world um, that live in our community and call home. And um, that's really great, but it also uh, uh, provides uh, some, some, some challenges. Um, one of the things about the Detroit Shoreway neighborhood um, that we talk about a lot is how it's a tale of two cities or two neighborhoods. Um, I mentioned that Gordon Square Arts District, and that's the area that a lot of people think about when they think about our neighborhood. And it's... Uh, uh, couldn't be, um, and it's a very small part of our neighborhood. Literally uh, half of the community um, kind of is, is south of a street called Madison Avenue. And I think that that's important to frame um, because as far as, you know, going out and getting engaged in your community, um, over the years, the Detroit Shoreway has been around over 30 years, and um, we have like a really robust network of neighborhood groups and block clubs. And they, anytime someone moves into the neighborhood, you know, they reach out to Detroit Shoreway. One of our programs is the Welcome Packet Program, and it, it is a way residents can contact our organization when they get a you know, new neighbor on their street, and uh, we help uh, uh, get them a packet with like a letter about the neighborhood group when they need contact information, and also coupons and things from across the neighborhood that'll be successful to them, as well as like resources, like important numbers to call and things like that for the city, and any other programs that we have. Um, we kind of act as a uh, intermediary between like a lot of different programs um, for rental assistance to paint. Um, and, uh, the, um, I, I kind of want to talk about uh, community involvement, you know, before the pandemic and now after the pandemic. Before the pandemic, we were really focused on that second side of the neighborhood that doesn't have robust um, block club groups and there's a lot of crime and um, illegal activity dumping and things of that nature. And people feel disconnected there. Um, so we created a, a program called participatory budgeting, and essentially that was taking the um, uh, the grant thing that we do as a as a nonprofit and putting it in the hands of the community, where they actually get to vote on those um, how money gets spent. So we got a, a large amount of money from Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, and instead of um, us deciding how it's used in the community, we reached out to these uh, a very small segment of the neighborhood in the South Service area um, that's just. And disconnected and it kind of got flipped on its head uh, when the pandemic hit so a lot of what we've been doing um, has been based around rental and utility assistance um, connecting residents to the city's program and the state programs for that type of help and then also getting people food free food we had a whole bunch we had about eight businesses um, that uh, did a eight week uh, six businesses that did an eight week um, every day of the week free food giveaway high quality food from a lot of these local businesses so we're able to support them, but we also went out into the community 
in those uh, in our South Service area that's really disenfranchised um, and marginalized, and um, got them uh, uh, also were able to provide them with face masks. And another challenge was this is an election year, and it's also a census year. Two very important topics that apply directly to those same disenfranchised populations. So we really emphasize having people help them complete the census right then and there. Um, we had neighbors, uh, we actually were able to hire a couple trusted voices from the community to help do the census and also register people to vote. Um, and then uh, to that end, um, the very first step, um, and we also, one of the main things that we do is um, act as a fiscal sponsor for neighborhood groups that want to apply for grants like the Neighborhood Connection grant that Erica uh, talked about. One of the things that um, you have to have when you have that grant is three people with the same idea that want to do a project. So I always tell residents when they, the first time I get to talk to them or um, when they come in and they want to make a change, go out and get to know your neighbors, one or two neighbors. Just, um, you know, it's, it's you, you, change, true change happens when you're uncomfortable and it can be uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people even in these, some of these areas consider it to be danger to try to get to know new neighbors. But it really is um, proven that neighborhoods where residents know each other are stronger, um, safer, and even smarter. So um, that's, that's one thing um, that uh, I, I want you all to leave here today is getting to know your neighbors. And I forgot to say that I love bicycling um, and I just bought a house in the St. Clair Superior neighborhood. So that's where I live. And I work on uh, in the Detroit Shoreway neighborhood. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. So, um, perfect timing. We're right at the halfway mark for, for our session today. Um, so now is an opportunity where we have some question, where we have question and answer. I'm going to give people a second to post questions. Um, to the group. You can either open them up to the entire group uh, of panelists, or you can um, ask people specifically, and I'll field those questions um, if need be. I, well, people, I'm, in giving people a chance to ask questions, I, I'm going to share a little bit more about the work that I do. I know I introduced myself as working at Tri-C, and I forgot to talk about the work that I'm involved in. Um, so, yeah, we, at Tri-C, we have a program in conflict resolution and peace studies. It's a certificate program, and it provides people with both exposure and, and skill development around skills for dealing with conflict more constructively. Um, we, we talk a lot about conflict resolution, but anyone who's a practitioner who deals with conflict realizes that a lot of conflicts can't be just resolved. And so we talk about how to deal with conflict in a constructive way, how to manage it, how to use it as a tool for transformation in the workplace, in our communities, in our personal lives. Um, so that's one of the areas that we focus on. And we have about half of our students are traditional students, meaning they're under the age of 25 and they're seeking their associate's degree while they're at Tri-C. And then about half of our students in our program are working professionals, people that are educators, community organizers, healthcare professionals, law enforcement, folks that are interested in learning the, the skills or developing or, or refining the skills for dealing with constructive and healthy way, and also learning how to um, promote programming and initiatives and, and uh, build relationships that are more peaceful oriented and what we mean by peace is right and healthy relationships that's what we're, we're all about um, so in addition to that I do consulting in in conflict resolution conflict management conflict transformation in the community I've worked with several nonprofits and uh, uh, edu institutions of higher education throughout the last few years um, throughout Cleveland so I just wanted to share that a little bit I'll share links as well um, so I, to start us out, we have some questions that are starting to come in, which is great. Um, so the first one is from Annie Armstrong, or Ann Armstrong. What are innovative ways of engaging the community? Um, 
So I know this is a huge question, right? I see Chris's huge smile coming across because uh, you know, there, there's probably a lot of different ways you could go with this, but would anyone from our panel like to take a few minutes to speak to Anne's question? Chris, do you want to start us out? Or JP? JP, go ahead. All right, <laughs> I'll jump in. Uh, so, Anne, great question, and specifically, um, you referenced the, the the keynote speaker and and kind of these uh, ethnographies, right? And so, um, you know, the, the 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 idea of doing deep ethnographies of, of our neighborhoods, of our communities, right? And so, uh, what I was talking about that asset based community development approach is is one way that I think um, uh, that we do that. So, in asset based community development, oftentimes what you can do is use those questions that I shared with you initially um, to uh, create and develop an asset map uh, of a com of a community of of a neighborhood, right? And so to um, identify those gifts, identify um, you know what what those um, what 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 do people have that they're willing to share, and what do they care enough about uh, in order to act, right? And to actually physically map those, um, uh, we use actually on our website we have a a toolkit on how to create an asset map um, from that kind of data using Google Maps. That way, it's already populated, you know, kind of what's there. Um, but that's that's one tool that I want to lift up. The other one is. Um, another practice we use at the Community Innovation Network is appreciative inquiry, which was developed um, here in Cleveland at Case Western. Um, and the idea of appreciative inquiry um, is to focus on um, what's right, what do we do well, what's what's good, and to build on that, right? So um, the metaphor I like to use with appreciative inquiry is um, uh, the, the story about, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, and so, um, the, a traditional problem solving approach would say, okay, let's look at all the bat, what's all the bath water? What's the, what's the stuff we don't want and let's get rid of it. Appreciative inquiry would say, what's the baby? Let's hold on to the baby, get rid of everything else. And we've got, you know, we, we held on to the baby and lost the bath water, right? And so um, that's, that's kind of another practice I want to lift up. Thanks, JP. Anyone else want to speak to this question? I'll just jump in real quickly because, you know, in, in, in our neighborhood, because it's it's very much reflects the city of Cleveland as a whole in terms of our uh, racial breakdown. So we've got over half of the neighborhood, 54 or so percent, who are African-American, about 42, 43 percent white, a couple percent Latino. There's a lot of opportunities um, to work across, across cultures. Um, I don't know if it's something that's, you know, it, it, I don't believe that there's any new way of engaging the community or any innovative way. It's really just a matter of taking what we know works and repackaging it in ways that fit current circumstances. So I'm gonna also kind of answer John Eckerly's uh, question about how it is that we've uh, used the pandemic and, to connect with residents. Um, there are far fewer opportunities for folks to meet in, you know, in rooms and to, to do normal types of events. Um, but one of the things that came out of our, our, our community stewards, and this is really where our innovation is coming from. It's not coming from me and my staff, it's coming from folks like you. Uh, they came up with the idea of doing a healthy, uh, healthy food tasting tour. So within a couple of blocks, a uh, bunch of different neighbors decided we're going to basically practice vegan cooking um, we're going to do it in a safe way, so they got training on how to how to do it safe, so that uh, we don't uh, uh, get folks, you know, put folks in danger. Set up uh, 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 card tables at the end of their driveways and invited folks to walk up and down the street, meet their neighbors, do it outdoors. It was a beautiful day a few weeks ago in which this happened, and we used food as a way to connect across across cultures and to connect neighbors with each other in ways that that they wouldn't have normally done and certainly wouldn't have been an idea that would have come up outside of a uh, of this uh, pandemic that we're that we're living in. So I would say, you know, just you just put it out there and you let the wisdom of the masses uh, tell you what what are ways to connect. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else? I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, 
So working across the board with, with residents, just looking at the ways that people want to connect. So like Chris said, like it's not, you know, there was no new thing under the sun. People have always looked for connection. Um, so, and also answering kind of the question about in this, in this time of virtual spaces and the pandemic. So a lot of our in-person spaces were like monthly meeting spaces before. And so the thing that has happened now is that we, um, right away, you know, everything closed pretty much on March 13th or March 16th, we were, how are we going to stay connected and keep people from feeling isolated and support people as they still try to stay connected to other people? And also how do we support people who still like are required to go out in public and are required to still work and are required to still be in contact with the public where they still feel like people haven't just left them out like, oh, well, you got to go to work and I'm safe at home. Um, and so things that used to be, one thing specifically that used to be a monthly meeting space in person has become a weekly meeting space because we look to the community and when we talk about this idea of co-creation, it is really about, yes, I'm here to support what it is that you want to do, but as a resident of your own neighborhood, as a person in your own community, you are the expert on what you want and what you need. And I'm not creating something that hasn't been asked for that I can support. Um, so we are co-creating this thing and like really out of this community of practice for community network building, people have really stepped up and people have shown that they want to be connected and it doesn't limit you to only, that's the one thing that I do really appreciate about some of these virtual platforms is that it doesn't limit you to if you have a computer or if you have a tablet, if you've got a regular old landline, like I do at my house, you can call in. So you might not be able to see people, but really the, the good old fashioned phone call is still a great thing. Um, a lot of times it's not innovation that's happening right now. We are going back to what we already know works. Like Chris said, door knocks still work because you can wear a mask and step back on people's porch. Um, you can still be in contact with the public. You can still engage with people in safe ways. You can still stay spaced out. You can still do the things that are required to stay connected. And people really want that, like, especially now. Like I was in my house for like probably a month before I left out to go to the grocery store. Um, I want to be connected to people, even if I'm six feet away from you in the grocery store. And, and so really using these virtual platforms has really like shown us that this is a good thing that we're doing and this is what people want. Like we, we talk a lot about in uh, the Neighborhood Network about uh, creating intentional and aspirational spaces. Like this is done on purpose. This is done with intent. This is done um, because people like people aspire <laughs> to this. Like people don't want to be just I'm gonna stay by myself and in this house and not talk to other people and not connect and not be engaged in community. People want to organize themselves like, and people are the experts on how to be in relationship with each other. And so really that's what we do in the virtual spaces. If, if you're able to do it safely in person, I can support you in figuring that out and also support you in getting um, the protective equipment in order to do that. Um, and so really looking at that is really just like, how do we continue to lift that up? How do we continue to, to answer the, the call, the authentic demand for what is happening in community? Um, and there was one more question. I think Tori, I can go ahead and put something in the chat too, but usually our footprint at Neighbor Up is uh, the neighborhoods of Cleveland proper and the city of East Cleveland. Um, there has been some expansion of that for some of the things happening just because depending on what funding source the grant money is coming from, we can expand the footprint based on their footprint. Thank you for that, Erica. And I, I think that's a good segue um, maybe to Rachel and JP to talk about the footprint of your organizations. How far do you, what, who can get involved and how? Rachel, would you like sure. to start there? Yeah, great. All right, so for Cleveland Leadership Center, we have kind of a range of programs that um, anyone who has an interest can apply for. Um, our high school program during the school year is specifically for high school juniors in Cuyahoga County. So we do have kind of a specific focus um, for that particular program. But generally, it is kind of the footprint of kind of the surrounding counties. Um, for Accelerate, it really is a, an entire range of individuals. One year we did have a high school sophomore win the entire competition and we've had retirees participate as well. So really we, we kind of say wherever you are on your community engagement journey, we have an opportunity 
for you to become involved, enhance the leadership skills you're seeking, and make those connections to the people and places in the community that can really help you advance the work you want to do to make a difference. Uh, Ty, you're muted, but I think you're asking me to go next. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, um, so I, I put this in the chat, but, I, but basically we do a lot of work in both the greater Cleveland area, in the city of Cleveland, and in suburbs. Um, we also do consulting work uh, nationally and internationally. Um, so we currently have a project in Elkhart, Indiana. We finished one up in Baltimore. We've had folks attend our trainings from uh, as far as Israel and Hawaii. Great. Thanks, JP. Another question that came up from Andrea is that I've recently started sustainability group. Any suggestions on for, um, for engaging folks in our Zoom weary world? Who would like to take that to start? Okay, I'll toss out a couple of things that have come again through, through our neighbors. So one, uh, walking tours is is one that you can definitely do no matter what the weather uh you know set it up with again this is just coming from not me from but from our, our neighbors um uh if you have specific things you want to take a look at uh you know you do that there's another idea that that came up uh real recently that i think we're going to do either this year or early next year uh where we're basically doing geocaching kind of in the neighborhood we're, we're setting up a way for folks to share things that are special about their part of broadway slavic village and to put it out there uh you know through social media to have folks uh look for this over you know look for uh you know this particular really cool house or this particular orchard or this store that folks don't know about um as a way to connect up with folks as well i mean it's a lot of this is doing stuff outdoors, but but being able to uncover those hidden gems that folks otherwise wouldn't uh, wouldn't know about. Thank you, Chris. That's great. Um, any other suggestions or insights, Erica? Yeah. Um, so something that's come up a couple of times, um, and th that people are doing because they are Zoom weary, and not everyone does have access. Um, to some of the platforms, or even if they do, they aren't necessarily comfortable using the platforms, or do, nor do they want to use the platforms. Um, and so something that came up in our uh, community practice gathering last night that I've heard in other places also, if, again, we're going back to what we already know works, people are writing letters, people are sending postcards. So there's going to be a, a Cleveland Pen Pals group coming <laughs> to you very shortly. <laughs> people were brainstorming that idea last night and they're looking to include other people in it. So look forward to your invitation to that conversation about being a pen pal for someone else. Um, I remember having a pen pal like second through fourth grade and it was awesome. So I look forward to doing these things because I mean, I'm on Zoom every day, but I definitely, I, I can tell you my children, my dog, like we have all, we all look forward to it. It doesn't matter what he's bringing. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Anyone else? JP, do you have an idea? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we try to do um, to combat Zoom fatigue uh, is to try to make our, our Zoom or our, those, those meetings that you have to do, um, try to make them as fun and engaging as possible. So it's it's great to have other ideas, but also there's, there's some things where you're going to be sitting in, in Zoom meetings. And I find that my energy level is different if I'm in a, a fun and engaging Zoom um, forum versus something that uh, is not that. And we use a, a, a process, Erica will recognize this. Um, we use a process, Neighborhood Connections, I know uses the same process in, in neighbor all called a, called a pipe for planning our, 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 um, our, our events and making sure we build that in. So pipe stands for purpose, intention, process, environment. And you'll notice process is the third thing. So the what you're gonna do comes after thinking about your purpose, what are you trying to accomplish, and your intention. How do you want people to feel throughout the event or program that you're doing? And whether that's on Zoom, whether that's a phone call, whether that's a garden walk, whether that, right, going through this and being intentional about that purpose and that intention 
and letting that lead to your process and your environment, how you set up the environment, um, will, will really help um, to, to kind of cultivate that. Another practice we use at the Community Innovation Network is to start every gathering we have. Uh, we do this in person or online. We start it with a check-in question, um, which is a way to get folks' voices into the room and to kind of prime the room for energy and fun and positivity. Thank you, JP. I love you all. All the events I've done with you guys have had great check-in questions too. So love the check-in question. Jeremy, Rachel, anything to add to the Zoom fatigue question? Yeah, I would say um, we've got some neighbors that so you know do their own thing. Sorry, was there a lag? Um, yeah, no, I was gonna say that there's neighbors that do those porch parties, things like that of that nature. Um, but what I would say, one thing that I think is really cool in this time where a lot of people are um, out and about, but not like mingling in the same way as public art um, on Bridge Avenue, there's some residents that turned to old abandoned, uh, maybe work on this project for a long time. Um, but public art, uh, I think is a cool thing um, to just brighten people's days um, as they're out and about, the people that are out and about. Great, thanks, Jeremy. And Rachel, back over to you. There's some ways to utilize Zoom and utilize some of the features. So even just something simple like playing some music before the session starts or during a break really kind of engages people in a little bit of a different way and makes it kind of fun. And the breakout on Zoom, we're being able to take them in while still online, you're able to create some kind of more deep conversations and provide a bit of that safe space to really connect with someone. And I think that while we're tired of Zoom, it is still as the way that we can connect with everything that's going on. So being able to kind of just embrace it and bring the people together and offer up some, some good discussion points. We've seen some really great, meaningful conversations and outcomes happen, even though we can't always come together in person. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I might add two things to this one, actually. Um, one is, I think we have, at least in my experience, a lot of people like to schedule hour-long meetings and making sure that if a, if a meeting needs to be an hour long, using that hour long, but sometimes 45 minute meetings are nice too, right? A little bit shorter time where people have some 15 minutes of freedom at the end to maybe go stretch their legs outside and setting aside that, that extra 15 minutes for people to get away from the screen. Another thing that I've seen um, that I really like is encouraging people to take their Zoom meetings in different places of their house. So you get to see a little bit of a different perspective than just the same wall or the same office room. Uh, so bringing it over to some plants or into the living room or into uh, a spare bedroom or onto the back porch for a change of scenery, both for yourself, but also for the people you're on the meeting with. And it gives you a little bit more insight into who that person is as an individual as well. So I, I really like that practice. Um, so we are just about at time. I want to give, I want to spend these last few minutes just giving people, um, our, our panelists, an opportunity to kind of say a final word. Um, in parting. Uh, and this is really open-ended. It can be a word of wisdom or some, some advice uh, or a resource that people should check into um, in the community. Um, so I will model this, I guess, by saying thank you all for joining us. Um, and I know people have been hearing this probably a lot, but just again, reminding people to be both patient with yourselves and others during this process um, is, is just 
I have to remind myself that every day. And as we're having difficulties in tech with the technology here, just reminding myself, be patient with myself and be patient with this space, right? And the others on here. So that's that's my final word before I come back around and, and share a uh, parting um, next step. So I'm gonna call on the next person and each one of you gets to call on your next person. So I'm gonna start by calling on JP for his final word. Thanks, Ty. My final word uh, is to is is uh, what's at the heart of, of our work and our approaches at the Community Innovation Network, and that's just to focus on strengths and gifts and assets and what's right, um, especially in a world where we're dealing with a pandemic. Um, it's not to be Pollyanna-ish. Uh, it's it's not to ignore the the real challenges and the real problems facing our communities, um, our, our our planet, our our environment. Uh, but rather, it's to it's to build on on what is there by focusing on on what's good, on what's right, on what are the gifts. Um, we we take that, we honor that, and we build on it. And that's how we build 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 a brighter uh, future together. Um, I will call on Erica next. All right. Hi. Um, so every time someone asks me what I do, I always say I create hold and maintain the integrity of spaces where people can connect. Um, and the idea of continuing to do that no matter what the platform it is, oh, I guess my final word is what's so important is the connections. What's so important, uh, you'll see a tagline on a lot of things that we have where it's all about relationships. And I think that that's so much more important because it was so, I think it was almost easier for us to take relationships for granted, you know, pre-pandemic. Um, but we've really got to bring that focus back to the personal relationship, those personal relationships and building your personal networks out and not the networking that goes with, you know, business cards and a fishbowl, but really building out the network of people that you know, who you know is so important because that's where you get to do what JP is talking about. That's where you get to express your gift, skills and talents and your contributions to community is, and that's really where organizing comes together and engagement comes together is based on your personal relationships to the people around you, trusting the people around you, building yourself up as a trustworthy person. Uh, it leads to more engagement, leads to more involvement, leads to more organized groups. It leads to building out those networks, connecting with other people's networks. And that's exactly what's going to change everything that needs to be changed in our neighborhoods. And I will call on Rachel. Thanks, Erica. Um, I want to thank everybody who session today. Um, the only way we are going to continue to move our community and our neighborhoods forward is by people working together and being involved and caring about the community around them. So taking the time today to learn about how to do that and how to be more involved is, is what we need. And we need more people to continue to do that. So, and thanks to everyone on this panel for all the work that they are doing. And this is why we can make a difference here in Cleveland. And I am gonna call on Jeremy. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks everybody. Um, you know, getting to know your neighbors is really important. It, it helps a lot. And um, it's such a simple thing that anyone can do. Um, and uh, thanks again for everyone's time. And, you know, don't forget to uh, uh, come up with a, uh, a plan to vote. Um, uh, so, you know, vote early, vote often. Um, and uh, last but not least, Mr. Uh, Christopher Alvarado. All right. So just in case folks can't hear me, I'm going to put this off also. Uh, the closing word is mutuality. Uh, we've all got gifts. Everybody out there has a gift. Uh, the, some of the most profound lessons I learned uh, was back when I, I lived in a community center around folks with intellectual disabilities. The lessons that they taught me about humility, about love, about uh, openness and excitement, that's something that I held hopefully my entire life. Uh, everybody has a gift, including you. Show that gift. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, JP. Thank you, Rachel and Jeremy. And thank you, Kathy. Um, we are at time almost exactly. Wonderful, my friends. Um, before we part ways, I, I do want to encourage about the profiles of the presenters today. 
Um, they have bios and contact information. I also did post some contact information uh, a little bit earlier. Um, there is a closing session that uh, is coming up right after this final um, breakout session. So when you are done here, we encourage you to go to the stage button on the far left and check it out for the final closing um, session. Thank you all for the work that you're doing, um, both participants in the panel, but also community members that are joining us today. Um, sustainability and, and this work is, is not just about you know, eliminating or uh, lessening carbon in emissions and making sure that we're recycling, but it's about connection and building relationships and supporting each other um, to be not only environmentally sustainable, but socially sustainable as well, right? Um, and when we can do approach this in a holistic way, that's when we really can make some lasting change in our communities and in our, our cities. So thank you all so much for your work. Um, I am so grateful. Be well.